Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Corey Cox, Senior Vice President of the Tandit Group of Companies, and I will be your host for today's webinar, Learning How to Harness Artificial Intelligence in Your Business. We have some fantastic content for you today, but before we get started, let's take care of a couple of housekeeping items. We will make every effort to finish on time. I encourage you to stick around uh, to get the full benefit of the program. There's lots to take in today, and I think you'll be very glad that you uh, you took the time to, to hear it all. Uh, watch for a thank you email from us, uh, which will contain a download link to today's presentation. And uh, you should receive that within a, a handful of days after today's presentation. And if you would, take a, a moment or two to fill out the evaluation form. Uh, it is important to us. It helps us ensure that we continue to deliver quality content for you. So your opinion uh, is always very important to us. Now, let's get to business. Not long ago, uh, business leaders were wrestling with digital transformation, DX. It's a term we've heard many times who to involve, what to action, how to limit risk. Uh, you know, then of course, as we all know, the pandemic arrived and this forced companies to kind of turn their DX programs into overdrive. But now with 2022 on the horizon, many organizations are looking at AI as that next natural step in their DX journey. The problem is, is that many of us uh, haven't got the foggiest idea of what we should be doing with it, uh, let alone why. We, we know it's there, we believe it's important, but we're still struggling with understanding exactly what we're going to do with it or can. So, I mean, you know, let's be clear, AI can be very intimidating. It's just not something that you turn on with the flick of a switch, uh, you know, that, that goes on autopilot and just does its thing. Winning big with AI is not just a question of knowing where, to effectively deploy it, but you know, most importantly, how. So joining me today to discuss this very issue is my good friend, John Drucker of OVH Cloud, uh, saying hello to us from Montreal today. How are you doing, John? Good, I'm doing well, Corey. Thanks for, for introducing me, appreciate it. Fantastic, fantastic, great to, great to see you again. Well, John, I know that uh, you've got uh, a really great presentation for us today. So uh, why don't we just uh, lead into it? Let's get going. Sure, uh, I'd love to. So um, as Corey mentioned, uh, a lot of companies are talking about AI and I wanna use it to be able to you know, get better insights, to um, leverage the data that I have that's being generated by machines, by people, by interactions. But then getting AI off the ground and into the cloud is is not as simple as it sounds. It's it's quite a complex tax, but it, it bears tremendous tremendous fruit for any organization, whether they're public or private. Um, and what I'm going to do as we get into this, I'm going to explain at the beginning a little bit about who we are at OVH Cloud because that kind of plays a role. And then we'll get into more about um, what are the barriers or what are the, the reasons for hesitancy of the adoption because not everyone jumps into it immediately. And then we'll kind of explain in greater detail the different practical aspects any organization will need if they want to go into start building AI projects. So I'm going to kind of move us ahead. Um, this is, you know, we call it the marketing part, but just to give you an idea, because we're relatively unknown in the market and we are a global cloud service provider. We're like Microsoft Azure, we're like Google Cloud, we're like AWS. We just happen to be based in France, believe it or not. Uh, and we've uh, moved out to different regions of the world. We're across four continents and uh, we are a vertically integrated model. We build our own servers. Uh, we actually build some in Canada and some are built in Europe. And we have our own data center in Canada as well as uh, 31 or 32 data centers across the globe. Um, and it's our own, we don't co-locate. Uh, we actually own our own fiber and all that kind of stuff. And we have literally over 1.6 million customers now across the globe. So not everyone has heard of us because we are focused on Europe for the moment, but we've been expanding in North America for a little while. So uh, an important aspect to think about this is that we have a global network to move your data around so that you have an efficient business, that you have efficient abilities to run projects, be they AI, or if you want to do data mining, or if you want to just store data or whatever the case is. Um, that global reach has given us uh, a perspective on how best we can build solutions to handle data intensive applications, whether it's compute or storage or networking. And in Canada, um, our head office is in Montreal, 
uh, and our data center is just south of Montreal. It actually has a capacity of over 380,000 servers, and I think we're up to 400,000. And we're going to be opening a second one in Toronto, or in the Toronto area, I should say, in the coming year and a half or so. So we're 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 kind of expanding our our footprint to be able to give uh, other companies, to give other organizations, uh, an option beyond just the the three hyperscalers. Um, because in a world of multi-cloud, where companies are using multiple clouds to run things, uh, it's important that people have choice uh, and people are able to shift their loads as they need them for the best performance, the best price, and also for regulatory reasons. Um, so before we get into this aspect of it, um, and it's important that I kind of point this out, is that we have a different series of products, depending on how you want to do any of your projects, and particularly for AI, um, there are four categories, but the, the ones I want to focus on on this slide are basically the one on the far left called our bare metal cloud. Essentially, we have dedicated servers and we have some customers that will uh, keep their dedicated servers um, you know, through our network. They host them with us and they'll equip them with mostly basically Tesla chips to do local number crunching for these kind of things so they can actually run AI projects on their own and keep it dedicated. Or uh, the second from the right, public cloud, we have our public cloud platform that has our AI and ML platform uh, that houses with together uh, database managed databases, uh, data cont containers and orchestrations. Um, and that's all based on our, our network that we have as, as OVH cloud, our own private network. Uh, we offer a private network in addition to public. And uh, we actually have more than 22 terabits of uh, network, which says in the bottom, we actually have 32. Uh, it's recently updated. And we also include anti-DDoS. So the reason why I'm bringing this in is that for AI, you're going to have different ways to approach a product or a project, I should say, whether you want to do it in a public cloud or you want to do it in a private cloud. Uh, with your own dedicated resources or not. And that's part of the stuff that we're going to talk about very shortly as to how you can handle your AI projects because they are complex. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, John, I, 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 sorry to step on you there. I thought this would be a great chance to uh, to uh, put out a poll question to the audience and get some of the uh, get, get some of our brains ticking here on, on our subject matter today. Um, so uh, if I could ask everyone here, just chime in, uh, take a moment here and fill out this for me. What do you see as the biggest impediment to implementing AI in your organization? Is it seen as just too expensive, something that can only be afforded by uh, large enterprises? Um, is it about the skill set? You know, I'm not sure which that we have that skill set to implement it. It will take too long. It's just something, an investment that just can't pay off. It takes too long. Determining data residency and data regulatory requirements that can be daunting at times, or just wading through the myriad of buzzwords, which I'm sure John is going to uh, help address here today, you know, as part of my difficulty in determining our path to entry. John, um, and by the way, thanks for that uh, privilege there. I've always thought that OVH was uh, one of those best kept secrets out there. Um, where, where do you think this is coming? When we look at these five questions, where, where do you think our, our audience is going to weigh in heavily today? I think it's going to be a bit of a mix, but um, sometimes it's a, a skill set uh, issue. Uh, it's not always easy to know who to have and what to have on a project. Um, and sometimes it's cost. I think those are the two biggest ones from my point of view, but I'd love to hear what our, our audience is voting for. Uh, the buzzwords, uh, we, can, we can clear those up in no time. Sure. Sure. And I would encourage everybody too, while I'm thinking about it, as we go through it today, uh, chime in via chat. Let us know who you are, where you're from. Love to see who we have across the uh, continent joining us today. And be sure to um, ask questions whenever they pop into your head. If you throw them up there in chat, we'll uh, we'll put them to John and get him to uh, weigh in on his uh, using his expertise on the matter. So love to hear, Sophie. What, what have we got here for? Ah, okay. John, uh, you you are a uh, you are a uh, oracle here. I, uh, number two there. I'm I'm not sure we have the skill set to implement. Certainly was one of the things uh, you had brought up as something you expected to see, and there it is. And expense, which uh, which doesn't surprise me uh, as well. And and look at there, uh, buzzwords again. You know, sometimes we're our own worst enemy with the uh, number of acronyms we'd like to come up with to describe processes and and tool sets, and, and it just introduces confusion for a lot of people, even those in the business of, of using this technology. C couldn't agree more. Uh, I'm, not, I'm happy to see that this reflects what we've heard, and uh, it's uh, not always a simple thing to engage in, but uh, 
I think in the next few slides, we'll be able to give you a better idea of what are the challenges and, and ways to address those challenges. So it's, it's nice to see that, that, that what we've heard in the market is also what our attendees are, are seeing as well. Sure. Well, uh, on that note, why don't we uh, carry on? Okay. So it's a question we get a lot is like, what does it take to, to get this off the ground? Uh, and it's, uh, it's a project and it's something that you need to consider strategically for any organization, private or public. It could be university, it could be a business. Um, sometimes it's in healthcare, you name it. Uh, and it takes some forethought. Uh, and what I wanna do here is kind of go over the main reasons for hesitancy around AI technology and getting into the cloud in general. It's uh, something that needs to be given a bit of forethought before you want to engage in this. So where do we start? Um, several things come up. There are about four or five that come up. Cost, complexity, organizational maturity and team skills, data residency, and AI smarts that come with a big price tag. So on the cost point, there's an excellent article from uh, Wired about the ability to get into AI and keep doing this kind of thing. And there is a cost associated with it because you're not only going to have to dedicate technical resources, you're going to have to uh, engage with the right people. You're going to potentially need a data scientist. You probably will need a data scientist, depending on what you want to do, uh, to look at the data, to go through the different types of data that you have, because it's not just simple, I put in data. There are different types of data that are used for AI. Um, and you want to retrain these, these AI models as they're known, and I'll explain about the models in a moment, but you want to retrain and refine your models, which takes time and it takes resources, which takes money. The complexity aspect is uh, not so much the tools that you're going to need, but the complexity aspect often is how do we get the data that we have from a data lake into the right format and get it cleaned and then make sure that a data scientist is building the models and training the models and then actually getting into what's known as a, a machine learning aspect or a, a machine learning server to give, should give you those insights. It tells you what's happening. Um, so it's not just a simple, I plug it in and it comes out the other side. There is a lot of com complex work that needs to go into it. It's not so much that it's a bad thing. It's just the nature of the complexity that we're dealing with, with all different kinds of data. It's no longer just numbers. It could be images. It could be text documents. It could be videos. It could be music. It could be voice. And all those things make it a little bit uh, unique for each and every project for what you want to do, uh, like speech to text recognition, for example. The third one, organizational maturity and team skills. Uh, we've seen that to be a case quite often. And it's not because companies are uh, necessarily immature. It's just where does it fit along your journey? So you could be a company that's been around for 25 years uh, or longer, but your organizational maturity with regards to how you use your data will uh, determine on how easily and how quickly you can get into the cloud to do uh, AI learning uh, or machine learning, I should say. Um, and that means you have the right people in the right uh, places. So in terms of team skills, you're going to need people like data scientists who are able to explain to you what is the type of data that you need and how to look at the data that you have, what you should you consider as valid data and what you should exclude. Uh, because you want to have the best possible data. You know, if they say garbage in, garbage out, you need someone who really understands the nature of data and how it's used, as well as people who are in the operations side who can work and say, okay, I know what kind of infrastructure we need. The DevOps and the, um, the infrastructure ops in your organization uh, that have to say, okay, I have a data scientist who wants to do this, but now I have to spin this up. I have to make sure that we're only using the amount of data that we have. We might have budgets in terms of how much data we can push through. Um, so there are a number of different aspects to it. And then once the data comes out, who reads the data and who says, you know what, now we have some insights into what this does. What can we actually do with it? So the maturity, again, is not just, you know, we're an older company. You could be a young company. It's a question of do you have the right people with the right skill sets, uh, DevOps, data science, and also the people who understand the business aspect of what you can do with data to come up with the questions. Um, you know, questions could range from, uh, I want to be able to understand my customers' sentiments better. I want to be able to identify images in documents better. Uh, a whole number of different use cases that require uh, an organization to come together uh, to make AI a benefit for its company. And the last one is data residency. Um, it's a smaller point, but it's still an important point, particularly with um, European GDPR. You might be a company that does business in Europe, 
or potentially you might be a business in Canada and you, your data must stay in Canada if you're in the financial sector, for example, government or healthcare. Um, so where does that data sit and where does it transit? Is it, is it even allowed to exit Canada to another country? Um, and if it is, which country does it exit? So these are things that could potentially bite you. And I know from a fact, I worked at a software startup a number of years ago and data residency was a key issue for us. We were working with Telefonica in Spain and that was our main customer. And they were very concerned about where customer data that could be used for AI uh, and that was going to be used for an AI model would actually reside and where would it transit. And for them, it was an absolute must have that it stays in the European Union. And they preferred actually that it would stay in, uh, in Spain. That was their actual preference. And that's part of what happens with AI is not just AI, the fact that what you can get out of it, but what's the business behind it and the regulations. I think there, John, you said a couple of things that resonated with me as well. Um, you know, uh, how important actually the business side is to this equation and understanding what it is that you want to focus on, which is really a business decision, understanding the, your own business knowledge domain. Uh, it's not so much a technical decision, but a very key part of understanding, how, you know, what these projects are going to look like. And uh, certainly the data residency, I mean, I look at, we have a fantastic cross-section of attendees today and in uh, you know we have federal, provincial, municipal governments, uh, finance and banking, and uh, and others where I'm sure that data residency uh, uh, question you just posed is important. I couldn't agree with you more, Corey. And um, it's the business side I think that really should be determining what you want to do with this because that will determine the scope of your project. What is it that you're focusing on, and where you're going to get value out of it? And Corey, you and I had spoken about uh, transportation as a potential sector, right? I might want to look at the average mean time till failure. So I need a ton of data coming off of IoT devices that are potentially in trucks or in trains or whatever the case may be. Um, and that would help my business to say, hey, I can predict when something might happen more accurately and take something off the road and repair it before it actually gets into something disastrous. Um, or CRM is a great one. What are my customers saying about me on uh, Twitter? What are they saying about me on TikTok? How can I use you know, video recognition, how can I use voice to text recognition to figure out how is this working and what do people feel about me? Because the, ultimately the business decision is, you know, how can I get a better insight with all the data sources that I have? It's no longer just a, a table, a, you know, a database table. It's all kinds of different pieces of information that are, are very unique to each other. So thank you for bringing that up. I think it's an excellent point. I'm just going to continue a bit here. Um, so Infrastructure is an important aspect of handling AI. Um, there are three things that you should consider or that you should be thinking about. Uh, you don't necessarily have uh, a right answer for these. These are just for each of your organizations. One is your, your internet infrastructure or your backbone. Are you using a hybrid cloud, meaning having some data on premise and some in a cloud provider? Could be us, could be AWS, could be Google, could be you name it. Uh, or a multi-cloud where you're using multiple clouds. So you're using multiple cloud service providers to house your data, to process your data, to store your data, um, to archive your data. And how are you going to use those kind of things? Because for an AI project, you're always going to be pulling information out of storage or out of a data lake. And there's a cost associated with that. The second point is, um, do you want to use a managed service or do you want to let your IT handle it? So there are companies that say, look, I have an IT department in-house. Uh, I want to leverage that. I don't want to have to pay for a managed service. Whereas other companies say, I don't want the headache of managing my infrastructure. I just want to use a cloud service provider who will provide me with other services as well. So I can focus on what it is I do best in my business. And we see a trend where more and more companies are going towards managed services so that they can focus on what it is that makes them successful. Uh, that's a really key trend that I could say is if you don't use a managed service, consider it because you'll be able to repurpose your own uh, in-house resources to better focus on how you can be more efficient operationally or just plain old make money. And Jonathan, as a, as a person who has to consider resources in, uh, you know, like this on a, on a daily basis, the other aspect to that managed services component is I'm also not competing with those companies who are hiring that, 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 you know, high price talent, uh, I'm, I'm able to not have to compete with them to try and hire those very same people. And I may or may not be able to do so. And I'm able, you know, it's kind of like a timeshare in Florida. I'm able to get a time <laughs> slice of their talent with that, you know, and, and saving some of that cost, not just hiring, but, but, you know, of saying, you know, how many can I realistically staff? 
that's a great point. Um, how can you exactly being able to staff people? Because it takes time. If you say, I want to do it in-house, there's the whole hiring process, the cost that's associated with that, uh, making sure that you have the funds because a data scientist, for example, they're, they're not inexpensive. Uh, and finding them is hard. They're not, not as many are graduating as we'd like. So um, it's, it's an excellent point. And uh, I also wanted to mention this is uh, something else is that there are smaller and more and more AI services companies. So they'll have developed uh, AI models already that you can kind of tweak for your own use. So you don't necessarily have to train your own one from the ground up. There are other companies that do that for you to help you get to market faster. And the last point, uh, which is kind of a more technical one, uh, that's for kind of the, the DevOps is you got to choose or you should be able to choose between a bare metal, also known as a dedicated server, or a public cloud or a private cloud. And the reason why that's an issue or uh, something to consider in infrastructure is if you want to have dedicated servers, it's your server to control from the ground up. You have to uh, put in the operating system. You have to do all the encryption. You have to put in the software if you want to have a hypervisor layer. So that means a lot of work, but you control that resource absolutely dedicated and it's yours. Um, if you want to use the public cloud like AWS or us uh, or pick anyone, it's not just us. Um, I'm, I'm not here to only promote my company. There are lots of choices out there and uh, for different reasons. Um, but a public cloud gives you shared resources at a lower price. Uh, and they also very frequently in public clouds, you're going to have workbenches that are on that so that multiple people can access it or multiple companies can access their own resources as they need them uh, for a lower price. It's just a, it's a cost issue. Or the last one is just a private cloud. And we actually have uh, a customer that uh, works with the um, federal government. Uh, and they were directed very clearly not to use dedicated servers, not to use the public cloud. They, they have to use a private cloud. Uh, which is a stipulation for the federal government for them. So there are different types of infrastructure that you're going to need to manage your data that will all feed into an AI project. So oh, I mentioned before multi-cloud and AI. Um, lovely piece from Statistia here, uh, really about the multi-cloud drive. And more and more companies, particularly on the enterprise side, are going for a multi-cloud. In other words, I'm going to have the ability to use uh, OVH Cloud, Amazon, Google Cloud, uh, DigitalOcean, you name it, different cloud providers so that I can balance my loads, balance my pricing, um, and also disaster recovery becomes a part of it. I know this isn't necessarily included with AI, but you have to think about how you're going to be ready to get your data out when you need it if something happens. And uh, multi-cloud also gives you that, that best fit case. So you can say, you know what, so-and-so has a better platform for this, or so-and-so is less expensive for this, or so-and-so is closer in region to me and meets regulatory needs. Um, so when you're considering AI, you're also probably considering, or should be considering at least, which cloud service providers you want to use when you house and move your data and store your data. Sorry about that, I forgot the uh, little thing at the end. Uh, Multi-cloud adoption is growing by, by 20%. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting field to be in because it makes your decision a little bit more complicated, but it's an important thing for how you want to run your business the best way possible. So you often hear the same things uh, when you are running an AI project or when you want to do it is, you know, which data and which database should I be using to manage project because you're going to have uh, structured and unstructured data. More and more data is unstructured, like photos, like documents, like uh, voice files versus straight structured data, which is, you know, names, numbers in a database and rows and columns. Uh, can you outsource the data scientist work? And sometimes you can. Uh, there are people who offer their services. Uh, managing the AI projects is not easy because you're going to, like as I said before, you're going to need system admin people to help you out. You're going to need different people at different levels to help you out. Uh, and the growth of data. Um, because you can get generate data from pick an IoT device or, or anything you can really think of, it's growing exponentially and very, very quickly, even faster than we had thought. And what that means for you is suddenly you have this huge amount of data, but do you need all of it for an AI project? How much should you be using? And this will come um, with time and with experience in AI projects of what the, the data amount or data sets need to be to gain insight and also keep it in within costs. Because the more data you use, potentially the more CPUs you're going to use and the greater cost there is. And we talked about data residency and legislation. Um, there are a few things in here I want to just mention for not everyone, or I guess I would say for the people who um, 
deal with the more legal aspects of this. If you are or not familiar, there's the Cloud Act in the United States, and there's also Consumer Privacy Acts. Um, a lot of data has been collected prior to uh, consent being necessary requirement. Uh, in the United States, you have the Cloud Act where if data transits the United States or resides in the United States, uh, the go federal government has the permission or has the right to go and look at that data to see what it is in case of it uh, is data that's potentially dangerous to the com company or the country, excuse me, the country. But you now have um, consumer privacy acts that are coming into conflict with this. So what data can you use if your customers are in the United States or if you don't want data to go to the United States? In Canada, we have PEPETA, which is a series of guidelines uh, about how we handle customer data or how we handle personal data, I should say, it's more personal data. And Quebec very, very recently introduced what's known Bill 64, which is a, I would say, a more stringent version of PEPETA that very much reflects the GDPR and the California Privacy Act. So when data is being used, how it's being used, what is the consent? For an AI project, that's a very big thing to consider because the cost potentially to a company is very high if they don't comply. And of course, if you're dealing with Europe, there is the, the EU, the GDPR, where you must be compliant. And personally identifiable information is something to think about if you go beyond our borders into Europe. Hey John, I'd like to ask you there, uh, I, because I know uh, the federal government in Canada is also considering um, uh, another wave, uh, I guess a, a PIPETA 2.0, uh, possibly as early as next year or 2023, kind of redefining again, perhaps more GPDR-like legislation. And I, you, you also had me thinking about, you know, IoT devices. We have some in our in our vehicles in our company that are sending back about 100 points of telemetry a second across their entire fleet. And um, you know, so I thought I thought about the volume of data. Uh, those two things, you know, residency and volume, I'm just trying to wonder what the driver is to multi-cloud. Are those two of the key drivers or? Absolutely. Yes, they are. Um, so how am I going to get data from the edge, like IoT devices, uh, feasibly into the cloud? Um, and how much do I actually need to get out of it into the cloud? Uh, those are questions that need to be asked. And I want to have it essentially in the cloud largely so I can take the essential information out of it. So there's that cost of getting it along the backbone into the cloud. Uh, and as well, it's um, for GDPR regulations, uh, and I had to do a whole piece on this when I worked at, at another company, it's what could be potentially personally identifiable information. Um, it could be an IP address. So you know, if I have a smart device and there's an IP address associated to it, is it possible that I could determine that it's you, Corey Cox, who, who delivered that? Now, it's maybe difficult to do, but it is a concern. Um, so it, having those things, though, that data, you know, I maybe I don't want to let someone know that I have this device or I'm using this device and I don't want it to be associated with me, is a genuine consideration because once it goes into the cloud, then you get to the data residency issues. Uh, in Canada, we're evolving more towards a GDPR approach to data. Uh, and I think it will become more and more, uh, I wouldn't say strict, but more regulated uh, over time. And as a result of the regulation, that means more hoops for companies to jump through. It's just, a, um, just a, you know, the cost of doing business. So I hope that I answer your question or I hope. Yeah, I, I think you probably lends to, you, you mentioned earlier about having a strategy of what happens if I need to move my data. As, as yeah. regulatory requirements change. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks. So um, just on the more practical side, so a few more things to consider. Um, regardless of who you choose as, a, as your cloud service provider, everyone should be thinking about these kind of things, which is um, high network capacity. Can I move a lot of data easily? Uh, it doesn't get bogged down. The second one is public and private bandwidth. Uh, almost all cloud service provider will offer you public, which is the internet essentially, and private, which is their own cable. Um, and that's good because if you want data that's shielded from the public internet, uh, pri you know, private bandwidth is a key one, uh, and it's, it's a nice little security feature to have. Um, having unmetered traffic is another aspect. Um, how much traffic, once it's in, uh, let's say, uh, OVH Cloud, once your data is in our network, you're not charged for moving it around. So you can move it from Singapore to Montreal and back, and there's no additional cost for data traffic. Other companies do charge some, and that's something to consider because there will be a cost associated with it. And if you're in a multi-cloud environment, you need to balance your costs. Um, and 
do you have an AI data platform? Do you have the tools like, you know, we have one, Google has its workbench, uh, Amazon has their workbench as well. Everyone is gonna have a little bit of a different flavor to it, different levels of complexity. And the last one is open standards. And I'll talk to the open standards in that, um, the open standards really are important in that um, there are a lot of companies that wanna use uh, open tools. They wanna to use open source tools for flexibility and for time to market and for cost reasons. The open standards and open APIs give you the luxury, I should say, of having less chance of vendor lock-in. Um, when I'm using someone's proprietary stuff, there could be a cost associated with it. And also it makes moving your data around more difficult because once you're in, it's hard to extract. If there is an open set of APIs or open tools with less lock-in, you are more flexible to move your data about to a different cloud service provider. If you want to repatriate it back to another country, move it in-house, whatever your case is. Uh, I, I, it's underestimated in terms of the open standards of having open APIs, but it's a small detail that I think warrants uh, a lot of thought, a lot of consideration. So, poll question. Let's see what we've got coming up. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry I was muted. Wow, I didn't think I would be guilty of that, but there <laughs> we go. Uh, yeah, so Paul, thanks, John. So what's the key driver for interest in uh, AI or ML in your organization? Let's see what you think about this. Is it reducing costs, uh, driving you know more effective resource management? Is it about supply chain management and insight into that supply chain? Are you looking for quality assurance and analysis in your uh, in, in the production of the goods and services that you're responsible for? Or sentiment analysis? Uh, John mentioned this earlier, things like buyer influences. Is this, is, is this a motivating factor for you? Um, or is it that uh, thing I kind of alluded to earlier, we want it, but we're not quite sure where to start? And uh, I would also remind everyone, because we do have such a fantastic cross-section in our audience today, you have some outstanding questions, I know, in your head. I encourage you to put them onto your keyboard, and uh, let's take advantage of John here, who uh, is just the type of person we need to answer some of the questions that we have over this type of technology. So I encourage you to uh, throw those questions in there, and let's put uh, John to the test. John, where do you think we're going to go with this poll? That's a good one, because um, they're all really good ones depending on the industry or depending on the vertical. Um, I think the last one we wanted, but we're not sure where to start is a key one. Uh, and they, they all make good sense. I could say, I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say, you know, reducing costs, more effective resource management. But I, I think that last one might be uh, a key. I'd love to see what people have to say. And ask me questions, please. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to putting that brain of yours to the test, John. Let's see where we are. Um, more effective resource management. Uh, very interesting. I know that would uh, honestly be one of the answers I would give to that poll. And um, <laughs> my organization may be just as guilty on, on the last part too, uh, trying to identify where we can derive that value. Uh, picking that lowest hanging fruit looks like is a big part of that challenge too. And I think John, you alluded to that. Yeah, uh, I think those are the main ones that we hear. and and. Cost reduction obviously is key as we've seen uh, inflation going up uh, since COVID and we're back in getting, trying to get back to life. But uh, the last one, if we're not sure where to start is, is great. You have a lot of competing interests, whether it's a public or a private corporation uh, who say, well, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. Um, where do you start and how do you begin? Uh, there, there are lots of practical things that we can get into uh, as we follow along in the slides that'll hopefully give you some enlightenment on the practical side. Yeah, and if I could also encourage our uh, audience today too, maybe tell me what you think is your low-hanging fruit in, in, in your organization, where you think AI might have the greatest, uh, greatest impact in your organization. Love to see your thoughts on that. Uh, John, sorry, uh, back to you. Oh, thank you, uh, no problem. So this section is a little bit about, you know, how do I use the AI on a regular basis? This is really the practical stuff of getting a project done, 
uh, what do I have to think about when I'm actually when I've chosen what it is I want to examine? So, you know, let's say we've chosen I'm working at Corey's transport company and I want to look at time series data or I want to pull data off of, of vehicles to see when they'll break down or what am I going to do um, or, you know, what routes are the most effective, for example. So what is the actual day to day for people in your organization uh, of, of implementing a project? So on that note, uh, let me see if we can go forward. There we go. Um, we feel, I feel, I mean, this is my, my opinion, is that using a public cloud has a lot of AI advantages. So you could use a private cloud if you had to. Um, but I think for a lot of commercial projects, not obviously ones that involve super sensitive data, um, you get a lot of um, advantages with a public cloud. Like us, like Azure, like Google Cloud, like AWS, like anyone you can think of. Um, you get a lot of flexibility. Um, it's your infrastructure to handle. Um, you can really do it by the project. So you can say, look, I want to try one project out. I don't like it. I'll close it down, spin up another one. The public cloud gives you just more flexibility in terms of doing things by the project. And that is often the way most AI, uh, most AI projects are held. It's like, let's try this out, fail fast, move on, uh, and not get too much into the cost or deep costs. The second one is about fast spin up. Um, so what we often hear from our customers is, I need to get going quickly. I need to have databases that spin up easily. I don't want to spend time or effort or money having a, a database admin spinning up a bunch of servers that could take 10, 20, 30, 40 days, depending on what the case is, depending on the size of the organization as well. And another thing to consider in terms of public cloud is almost all public clouds uh, and our competition, they offer uh, what are known as um, managed databases. So instead of your sysadmin having to configure the database and do all the permissions and do everything uh, and the patching and the security, managed databases like MongoDB for non-structured data or Kafka or Redis or MySQL Server are a really big, big help to be able to house and organize your data for these projects, these AI projects where you might be doing some development. The other thing that I want to point out is with AI, most of platforms, not just ours, most platforms let you do things by the job. So you say, I want to, you know, I have a project and I want to run a bunch of uh, GPUs on a particular series of data. You essentially set it up by the job as opposed to saying, I'm going to book this for a month. And you might not need it for a month. You might not need it for a week. You might only need it for a job that's six hours or two hours or an hour. So when you can do it by the job, you can really, uh, ensure that your costs stay, uh, I would say, uh, reasonable. Uh, yes, it is a little bit more expensive to use GPUs and CPUs, but that's just the nature of the, of the business right now. Um, but being able to do it by the job gives you that granular control over the length of the project and coincidentally, well not coincidentally, and, and directly the cost of it. And the last one is, um, in a public cloud, it's you'll get better performance with some respects. And in terms of those that performance, um, we do this and our competitors do this. We all work together with NVIDIA. They have NVIDIA's uh, GPU cloud. So NVIDIA has basically put together its own ability to, or its own, for lack of a better term, a data center where it's all focused on GPUs, which are higher uh, compute power and then handle uh, tasks in parallel. You can use CPU for anything if you're just looking at numbers or crunching smaller bits of data. But if you really want to go for the heavy stuff, a public cloud that works together with uh, NVIDIA, like ours, like Azure's, like uh, AWS's, like Google's, um, it's a great way to get the most performance if you're really looking at a high performance type of AI project uh, where you're really crunching data and you need it done as efficiently as possible, particularly for a very large data sets. So going on. Um, there are a couple things that I want to bring up with regards to the public cloud platform. Um, the way you should be kind of looking at this is, is understanding what is the data that I want to pull into my AI project um, and where do I want to store it and how do I want to store it in a data lake? Um, you're going to have spreadsheets, you might have logs, you might have files, you might have photos, you might have a bunch of different things. Choosing the most effective and most cost effective and performance effective uh, storage is important. So there are two main ones. There's file, but most, most companies don't use file for AI projects. They overwhelmingly use object and block storage. And block storage is the most common one. It's slightly more expensive. It's very high performance. And you really use mostly for databases, uh, you know, structured databases. So for series data, names, credit cards, addresses, those kind of data that stays kind of static. Um, whereas object, um, object storage is really about 
uh, data that's quite static and will not change much, and it is less expensive, and it is great for non-structured data. And again, another example of non-structured data could be music files. I want to see which music files get listened to the most for how long. So choosing the right type of storage and getting it out of maybe on-premise and into the cloud, into your lake, is, is an important first consideration when you're building your AI project. We do OpenStack on ours, so if you're an OpenStack fan, uh, and we have a lot of developers that are, uh, it gives you the ability to use a lot of tools and gives you lots of flexibility. The second part is the data processing. Um, the most common one, the most popular one we've heard, and we use this is Apache Spark. Um, it is a way to clean your data. So when you put data in, you need to make sure that the data is properly sequen sequenced, that you don't have as much garbage in there. Um, and it takes time to do it, but you'll be using a data processing service to clean the data so that you can start to build your AI models. Uh, just about every platform offers this. We do too. Uh, we do it, we feel, at a very fair price. Um, so sometimes if you're considering price, that's one of the reasons that you could choose OVH Cloud. That's my marketing pitch for, for the moment. Uh, and then your actual AI project. So data scientists code their uh, models, their AI models, using uh, what are called AI notebooks. It's not a notebook uh, like a, a laptop. It's just called a notebook, and it's a piece of software that can either be installed locally on a machine or can be done in the cloud. We, we offer a cloud-based version of these notebooks, Jupyter being the most popular one. And that's where your data scientist actually works and says, I'm going to code this, and I'm going to try out different uh, permutations and combinations of how this data, uh, data model should look. It then gets pushed into what's known as AI training, where it's going to crunch using GPU or CPU. So that's when you say, okay, I've got my model. Now I want to test it out. Now I want it to crank through, and I want to see what are the results I'm going to get when I toy with it again and again. And that's the training aspect of training the model so that it starts to read the data that you want and interpret it the way you want. Uh, and that's going to change, obviously, over time because you're going to get new sources of information or you're going to get new data sets, new data inputs, hard to say. And then that last part is the machine learning aspect. And going back to a point that Corey brought up before about the conf confusion in terms, the machine learning side is that is a subset of AI. And machine learning is the thing that gives you that result that says, hey, we noticed that you know on every Tuesday, people from Montreal buy more uh, May West than people in Toronto buy more Joe Louis. So um, this is the kind of thing where you're going to get a, a tangible or a usable result that will lead to a better business decision from the machine learning. Everything up until that machine learning is all the background and all the stuff that needs to process the data. The machine learning is what gives you that practical insight to say, hey, here's the trend that we noticed. Um, and that's where you're really going to start to get the, the actual business value out of it. I know I've been going a lot, so if anyone has any uh, questions, well, please add the questions to the chat. I'm looking forward to get some of your questions. Um, and lastly, we have a bit about practical advice for using AI cost effectively. Um, and that practical advice is it's kind of, it's straightforward, uh, but it, uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't always happen in every organization. Um, and the first thing I'm gonna say is make some choices. You've gotta make choices, you gotta make plans. What are your options in terms of who are my providers and what are their platforms? And the second one, which Corey brought up, and I think this is probably more relevant for this audience, is what do you want to explore? Is it IoT data for, um, for maintenance? Is it sentiment analysis? Uh, and what kind of data do you need? Is it structured, like you know, database data, or is it unstructured, where it's going to be all different kinds of things? Um, this is so important because once you make that business decision and you make your choice uh, of what you want to investigate, and knowing which provider you're going to choose, because each provider is going to have its own advantages and disadvantages. Those are two of the key things to figure out what you want to do before you do anything. And once you've done those two things, then think about setting up a proper project. This is a project. You have to figure out how long you want to do it, what's the budget, uh, and your budget might change depending on how much data you use or who your cloud service provider is, and then have that project team. Um, have the data scientists ready, a sysadmin, and also the buy-in from the business side to say, this is what we're looking at to generate or garner insights from our data. John, uh, how important is that business buy-in to, to the success of these projects? Exceptionally important because it's it should be what drives all of the decision-making with regards to AI or any AI project. So 
the business needs to figure out first, where do we have blind spots? Where do we want to try stuff out? Uh, and if you don't have the business buy-in, you're basically burning money because you could say, wow, I found this really cool stat and we're doing this. But if it's not relevant to what makes you money or saves you money or makes your organization more efficient, um, it's you're going to be burning money, in my opinion. So I really feel that it is the business that should drive what it is you want to look into and work from that point down. That's just my opinion. <laughs> Um, last questions are much more practical, which is the data questions is where's my data? Is it across multiple platforms and providers? Cause it takes time to get it all together. Is it easily accessible? Do I have it in a data lake that I can use, or you could be using more than one. Is it the right kind of storage? Like I talked about before, is it object storage or block storage? Um, figure out in terms of costing, what is the approximate cost of pulling data out of storage? So every cloud service provider on this planet says, if you pull data out of your storage, I charge you network fees or something. It's us, it's everyone. So make sure that if you're gonna pull out these giant data sets, that there's a cost associated with it, just to give you better predictability of what your, your project may cost you. Uh, if you choose CPU or GPU and how many processors, because CPU is cheaper, but it's less performant. Uh, GPUs are more expensive, but they do parallel processing uh, and makes it faster. It all depends on what you wanna do. And you can choose some, some say, you can use 10 cores, four cores, three cores. Each one will have an effect on the speed and the cost. Another question to ask practically is, will you be training your AI models over and over? And the likelihood is yes, because you're gonna be refining this. But if you're going to be refining it over a regular period, that means you're gonna have a project going on over a regular period and costs associated with it. So the frequency with which you wanna redo your AI models and train them will have an effect on costs and budgets. And lastly, uh, if you have to deliver ML results, and you, or almost everyone does, um, find the ML engine that works best for you. Uh, ML engines are, differ from, uh, from provider to provider. Uh, generally, they, they give you information the same way, but um, see what you need to do, because sometimes there are companies that are just in the stage in terms of maturity, where they're great at training their models and they're not yet ready to do the, to, to do the machine learning aspect. That's an additional aspect that, that comes at the end. So those are some really practical things to think about when you want to engage in an AI project uh, to really further your business, to really further your organization and find out where you might have blind spots, where to find out where you can do better, uh, what it is are the problems that you want to solve that doing it on your own, you can't, it's just too much data to, to do it manually. So you got to use AI to do it. John, what party is typically making those technical decisions like CPU over GPU, uh, number of training cycles, that kind of, is that typically, is that your sysadmin? Is that your data scientist? Who is that? It's, your, it's a mix of your data scientist and someone more senior on your, your IT department because it's if your data scientist has uh, budgetary control, great, but often they don't. They'll be usually asked to put together the project, not, not really cost it out. So there is someone, I would say, if you're looking from a, a C-level perspective, a CIO would say, here's the budget we want to allot. And the actual practical stuff would be more along the data scientists. And a sysadmin should actually be involved in this decision as well. I mean, they're going to see what the, the, the tax is on the, on the network itself and, you know, what kind of resources are we using and when are we using them as well. So uh, it's a bit of a mix, to be honest, and it'll differ from company to company or project to project. Right. And, uh, yeah, um, this is, again, sorry about the marketing pitch part, but... Um, with OVH Cloud, we don't charge you for data that's inside of our, our network. Um, other ones do. Uh, I know I said this wouldn't be too marketing-y, but um, one of the things that we do provide that's, that's a unique selling position is if you do have public and private in our network, once it's inside of our network, we don't charge you for moving it around. Um, so you will have more predictable costs, whether you're doing AI or not. Um, but that's just a unique feature of, of OVH Cloud that I think makes us stand out and helps any of our customers better control their costs. Uh, and it's always something to consider because, you know, we all have limited budgets. Money doesn't grow on trees. Um, and it's one of the things that we do that's different from our competition. So just to give you a, a use case for an AI project, um, just to give you an idea, if I have a require, requirements are like I need a scalable GPU or CPU farm to run jobs in parallel. What do I want to do? Um, but I also need to control my costs. So when the only use it when the AI sources are required uh, and also balance my, my data storage. So those are my requirements. This is why, for example, we recommend using a public cloud with an AI platform. Uh, public cloud gives you that best balance where you can store data relatively inexpensively, inexpensively 
um, yet you will have access to, although they're shared resources, they're still the best possible mix to get you access to GPU and CPU to, to run your projects. There are companies that do this in-house, they for either legal reasons or other reasons, and there's no right or wrong. This is just a use case where we feel for most companies um, that they can do uh, an AI project with a public cloud. Um, and public doesn't mean your data is public, it just means anybody can, uh, any company that has its controls accesses shared resources. It's not that anyone has access to your data, quite the opposite, it's controlled. Um, and it's just that the resources, the computing resources are on a shared series of servers and data centers. So that's kind of where I wanted to go in terms of what a typical use case is for an AI project. Some of the things you can think about practically of what you to tackle, what to look at, um, and how do you get into it. But going back to Corey's original point is figure out what it is you want to look at. What are the areas where you want to explore and what are the pain points that keep coming up that you necessarily can't get a hold of doing it manually and look into this for an AI project to make your business or organization or anything more efficient. And um, I think I've done a lot of talking. So, you know, your key <laughs> takeaways are <laughs> it, it takes a team to execute AI projects. It's not by yourself. Uh, know what your data architecture is before starting. Plan for the cost and the training because it's a, a, a considerable component. Know your options from your cloud service providers. And lastly, AI projects don't just stop. They're always ongoing because you're going to want to, you know, re-examine the data at, at times. So, yeah. So, Corey, I did a lot of blabbing. I hope you have some questions for me. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, not. I wouldn't call it blabbing. I have to tell you, this is this is a a, a very hot topic at my organization, and I'm sure uh, many public and private. So, I, I appreciate your insight on these things. You know, what I hear coming up uh, again and again is planning for the costs. You know, and it seems to me that if you're working with a cloud provider and or an MSP or internally, but this may be where that external expertise really uh, can play a large role is understanding how we can ensure that we don't get hit with an unexpected cost, uh, you know, during these projects, that we know where those points of ingress and egress are and where those uh, bills can start, uh, you know, uh, tallying, uh, you know, as we're going through this exercise. Your, your point is is extremely valid because um, in the cloud, I mean, there are a number of studies that come out that have shown that you know over provisioning in the cloud has been a problem, whether it's AI or not. And the average amount of over provisioning for the cloud is about 30% beyond. So people are probably paying more than they need to, and they're not looking at the costing aspect. Um, knowing what your network costs are going to be for shuttling data is really really important. Um, and it's there, it sounds you know it's not exciting it's not sexy but for the uh, financial aspect of it and, and making sure that you can do this uh, feasibly um, knowing you know in terms of who you're going to be working with and chances are you'll be working with more than one cloud uh, more than one provider um, really looking at that data that gets pushed around because those surprise bills happen when oh wow I pushed a ton of data through this data lake and it was gigabytes or petabytes or who knows what. Um, and suddenly there's this shock at the end of the month and that money's got to come from somewhere. So it's looking at what is, I would say, also the most reasonable set of data in terms of size. And that's where a data scientist should really help you out to say, you know what, we only need this amount to be pulled out of a data lake to do this. Don't overdo it because you can you leverage the knowledge of your data scientist to do this. Yeah, and I've certainly been a proponent of that, that uh, we, uh, like I'm sure most of the organizations represented in today's uh, webinar, that uh, we have significant amount of data. And yet it's really the metadata, you know, the, the, the subset of data that can provide an incredible amount of insight in a much smaller data set that we don't really need all of it, maybe on occurrence-based deep information discovery, but for this type of a project, we really are talking about that metadata, that that information about information that's usually driving those results. Would you agree? I would strongly agree with that. Um, and in fact, I think that might be the little kernel that people can take away from this is exactly as you said, take away a look at the, the metadata. Uh, excellent point, Corey. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, in, in our fleet, uh for what we do in transportation i know i see i, I have a few uh of my industry partners on the calls today um on our webinar today but uh you know i talked about those 100 data points a second coming in 
uh, from our vehicles, uh, which is quite a flood of data, as you can imagine. But the reality is, uh, uh, as deep and rich as that is, I don't need all of it to gain those insights. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it seems to me, though, it's in that type of data that we can start doing, for example, uh, I, I think a low hanging fruit, and this could be for people in manufacturing as well and warehousing uh, comes to mind where we're looking for opportunities or sorry, potential for accident or behaviors by operators that could be potentially risky, but not apparent to you and I on a day-to-day -day basis. But those types of insights is, is, is exactly what an AI project, for example, would be, would be really well tuned for. Oh, strongly agree. And I think your, your point about having I mean, a smaller data set, this is where the data scientists should be able to help you to say, you only need so much for a sample size to start building out, you know, where, where we're going to be going and extrapolate. Um, because you're right, you have a ton of data coming off the machines. Um, what do you actually need? That's that's a great one. And I think, um, you know, for transportation as given COVID and what it has shown us about number of cars on the road and number of, of deliveries that are happening uh, and the number of hours that, that people in transportation have to work, um, there's a real safety issue. And it's amazing when you think about it that AI could help to reduce the complexity or, or the, the the danger in this by being able to better predict these things. I think that's an excellent point. And I think, you know, something that probably represented by uh, our, our entire cross-section of attendees today is uh, HR. Um, the the process of, 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 of employee and contractor uh, well-being, mental health, um, work environments, ergonomics, all the things that kind of go into um, us performing our work every day, and that sentiment analysis um, in human resources, uh, perhaps onboarding and in other areas is, is once again where AI could play a significant role for any organization. It, yes, and it's funny you say because, you know, there have been a number of articles uh, in North American news about the great resignation of people leaving and taking off and what is an impact that that has on companies. And I want to know where the sentiment is going as soon as possible, not a month or two or three months after the fact where suddenly I've lost some of my staff. I think that's a great point in terms of, you know, keeping human capital happy and employed in your company. It's, I think it's a great point. Thanks. Um, you know, John, we're, uh, boy, I tell you, this hour has just absolutely flown by. We're almost out of time. Um, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a chance here to offer us all one last insight in a moment, because uh, I, I like to take every advantage of every minute I have with you. Uh, but just before we go to everyone, a reminder once again that you uh, will get an evalu uh, an, uh, a request for an evaluation of today's webinar. I would truly appreciate if you would take a couple of moments and fill that out. It really does help us ensure that we provide a quality product to you. Uh, John, once again, I would love to thank uh, OVH for sponsoring today's webinar and making this exchange uh, of ideas possible. Uh, without companies like OVH, we can't do things like this. So thank you very much for that. And uh, with that, John, final words that we can all walk away and be that much better with today. Yeah, well, um, get informed, know what you want to do, as Corey pointed out. Um, consider what your, your technical options are, consider what your business options are, and um, you know, really think about what is the advantage that you could take uh, from an AI project uh, to make your place better, the world better. And um, yeah, that, that's the best I can come up with, I guess, for this. Uh, that's great. I appreciate it. Uh, to everyone, watch for that email uh, that you'll get uh, in a bit. It will contain a download link to today's uh, presentation. Once again, thank you all very much for taking time out of your day today to join us. Uh, we appreciate the contributions that you make to the world at large and everything that you do every day in your work. Thank you once again. Uh, should you have any questions following the webinar, don't hesitate to reach us directly. Once again, have thank you. Afternoon. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you.